All right. Well, it looks like we've got uh, we've got 54 people here that have signed in, so I don't want to uh, keep you guys waiting. I want to be respectful of your time. I appreciate you um, being prompt and uh, logging in. Today, we're going to talk about adding molecular testing to your laboratory. We're going to co-present this with Vachette, um, which is a consulting group that specializes in reimbursement and revenue cycle management. That's a lot of the questions we get. So um, Lighthouse Lab Services, uh, especially more on the scientific side and Vachette, um, we'll be speaking towards the reimbursement uh, side of things. So we're going to cover both of those today. Um, but we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I'll give a little overview of uh, our services, and I uh, guess I'll throw this disclaimer up before we even get into that. Um, we are not a, a law firm or anything of that nature, so this information is our opinion that we're giving today. It's also um, Vachette will be giving their opinion on things. Um, but we do uh, disclaim that you know if you're if you're looking to take uh, business action on this, you still might want to run it through your counsel and make sure that you get all your T's crossed and I's dotted before you do so. So I'll give you a moment to just digest that legal disclaimer there, and then we'll we'll go ahead and move into um, the introduction. So Lighthouse Lab Services, um, this is something that we do at no cost um, and the reason we do that is we feel like if the laboratory industry is healthy that's good for everyone right so our labs are our customers we want you guys to uh, be making money to be growing to be hiring some of the different services that we provide we merged three companies together about two years ago um, so lighthouse lab services is now the conglomerate of what was formerly lighthouse recruiting and so we are the largest medical laboratory specific recruiting firm uh, just focusing on recruiting those individuals from the phlebotomist up to the pathologist or C-suite. Uh, we don't do anything else outside of um, clinical lab, so we don't even do biotech, pharmaceutical, industrial labs. You know, we just do the medical lab. That's what we know and what we do best. Um, so we run some of the largest groups, if not the largest groups in the world of medical lab scientists on LinkedIn and on Facebook. If you're a, a lab professional, we'd encourage you to join those groups some really great networking going on in those forums, information being exchanged between other labs. And so a lot of it should be a good value add to you guys. Also, if you need staff, that's what uh, we specialize in doing. So we provide the medical lab directors to about 150 labs. Those are part-time medical lab directors. We can also help you source full-time individuals um, from those staff level um, molecular scientists up to the PhD level uh, or pathologist level molecular um, individual. So if we can assist with that, it is a tight market, let us know. Consulting, um, we help with validating LDTs, right? So we work with Illumina and Thermo, we'll get into that a little bit um, more, but if you're looking at adding molecular into your lab or you need any other consulting services, getting credentialed to receive samples from other states, um, audits, uh, anything that uh, involves setting up the lab from the filing of that CMS 116 form, uh, all the way through to uh, remediation after uh, an inspection or getting cap accredited, we can assist with that. And then our buyer seller services division is a business brokerage group that just focuses on the purchase and sale of CLIA labs. So we've got 27 CLIA labs for sale right now. About half of those are actively listed, the other half are confidential. Um, so if you're looking to make an acquisition in order to get into a different uh, MAC for reimbursement reasons, we'll get into that a little bit on our presentation today. You want to acquire a book of business, you need to get an in-network status with Blue Cross in a certain area, uh, let us know. We'd love to help you with um, identifying in that transaction to acquire another group. We have labs starting at around $80,000, $90,000, and those go up to uh, north of $10 million. And so depending on what you're looking for, we should be able to help. Also, if you're ever looking to make an exit, we'd love to uh, assist with that. And we are going to be co-presenting with Vachette today, and Ann Lambrick is their VP of Client Services. And um, we're going to hand over the controls to her a little bit later in the presentation. And I'll let her tell about what Vachette does and the value that they bring. Um, really great to have them co-presenting with us because we are a scientific consulting firm, but I feel like about 50% of the conversations I'm in with lab owners, I'm dragged into speaking about reimbursement. We can talk to reimbursement from a secondhand knowledge. You know, we see what our clients are experiencing and we can uh, pass that along. We see market trends. And we'll talk about that a little bit today, too. But uh, Vachette gets to see it more in the black and white, nitty gritty. They're auditing labs, books regularly. They service uh, the revenue cycle management for many labs. And so they're able to, 
to really dig down a little bit deeper than we can. So we wanted to bring them in on this webinar so they can speak from an expert point of view on that. Um, I will go ahead and uh, put out now, just in case it's helpful, a uh, opportunity for you guys to respond to getting more information. So any of the things I talked about just now with recruiting, consulting, or buyer seller services, if you're interested in hearing more about that, we'd love to have that conversation with you. On your screen, you'll see a, a pop-up and you can uh, click more information if you would like to hear more. Otherwise, just exit out of that. Um, but we'll go ahead and we'll get into it today. We're going to be talking about the molecular testing that's happening, the trends. I know that molecular is a very big group. We're going to focus on what we're seeing in terms of industry trends. These are the things that labs are adding to their, their menu right now. And it's pharmacogenomics, it's cancer genetics, and it's infectious disease. And that infectious disease can mean RPP, GPP, wound, fungal, nail, women's health, you know, kind of STI, a lot of different uh, flavors of that. But these are the areas where we're seeing a lot of growth. And uh, that's what we mean when we're saying adding molecular testing to your lab. We'd be happy to help with other types as well, but that's going to be the focus since that's where we see um, most of the, the volume and most of the requests coming from. Um, today, we're going to go over kind of what you need to know. Um, the, the market state, the regulatory and compliance um, issues, equipment, timeline to adding that in, the staffing needs if you're thinking about doing that, some of the expenses that might be involved in adding it, and kind of what the path forward might look like. Um, I do want to let you know that we do have a Q&A area for, uh, set up, so you'll see that on your right-hand side dashboard. If you do have a question, we ask that you would put your question in there. We will try to get to it uh, throughout the presentation potentially. If not, at the end, we're going to try to go through those and answer most of your questions. If they're really specific or diving deep, we might need to take it offline. But any questions that add value to the whole group and the individuals that are attending, we'd love to tackle those today. So um, we'd ask that you enter your questions in that Q&A area and we'll get to it. Also, I'd like to throw a poll up as we get started here. So if you click on polls, you'll see a question that says, do you currently perform molecular testing? Yes, no, not yet, but we want to. If you don't mind, go ahead and uh, give your response there. I'd just love to kind of crowdsource that and get some real-time data for all of you guys to see who is doing molecular testing uh, right now, who's not, and who's thinking about doing it. And so you can go ahead and fill that out, and we'll have those responses coming in, and you'll be able to review those as, um, as that happens. As that's going on and you guys are filling that out, I will go ahead and uh, move into the, the content that we're going to present. So uh, molecular testing market, just wanted to go over what the opportunity is. And more than anything, I feel like this opportunity is coming about and growing as rapidly as it is because of PAMA cuts and just the commoditization of many other types of lab testing, right? So I firmly believe that if you're a laboratory that's continuing to just offer bread and butter core lab testing, uh, metabolic panels and CBCs, it's going to be really hard to survive, right? You have to do so much volume. Even LabCorp and Quest seem to be moving and pivoting away from that business, at least not making it their core. Tough way to make a living. I know that I'm preaching to the choir for most lab owners here. You need to find a way to diversify your menu and you need to find uh, an area where you can offer some higher margin testing. And so I think Molecular checks those boxes really nicely. And I also think it's a really big growth area. You'll see on the screen here that they're predicting the molecular testing market to be about $6.5 billion. It's a large, large chunk in uh, infectious disease making up um, more than or about half of that with $3 billion. And so a lot of opportunity here. And the reimbursement is just worlds different from what we're seeing in other types of more commoditized testing, right, where you might be looking at a 15, 20% margin after your cost of goods. Uh, we're seeing, you know, a much better multiple, seeing maybe 8 to 10x over cost of goods in terms of what the return on uh, on that is. So it is a really attractive area, and I think that's why people are going into it. But there are, um, there are some things you need to be aware of. So we're seeing a trend in particular uh, around CGX, also touching on PGX, um, where we're seeing basically groups go out and proactively market laboratory services, primarily to uh, Medicare patients. And so they're finding those patient populations that meet medical necessity without the patient coming to them, the patient's not even seeking out their doctor, right? So um, we could debate the ethics of this approach. Um, I've 
heard from their side and how they would pitch it is that they feel like these Medicare patients have risk factors. They also have resources. They've paid for Medicare their whole life through their taxes. And since they have the resources to be able to get this lab testing, they also have the medical necessity that requires it, that they're doing the world a, a favor by connecting these two things, right? So they're proactively going out, finding these patient populations that have the risk factors, connecting them with the resources that, um, that they are owed or that they have uh, available to them. That's their take. I would say that dealing with some of the groups that are doing this, there are certainly some unsavory type characters uh, that are operating in this space, and I don't think they're doing it for uh, the improvement of health that need to be made here. And whenever that happens, I think we've seen that in the toxicology space over the last five years or so, you see it bring uh, some of the, the bad actors out of the woodwork. And so we're seeing that for sure right now. So I would say as you get into this, you start looking at molecular as a lab owner, you're going to start getting approached with groups that have sample volume and it sounds too good to be true. And I think that they probably can deliver on the sample volume, which is uh, different from probably what you've seen from distributor groups in the past that all guarantee that they've got uh, a couple thousand samples for you and then they, they produce very few. This, the samples uh, will come through, but you need to be very wary of where those uh, samples are coming from and how they're required, right? So when those call centers are reaching out, if they're proactively reaching out, there's some danger there on how you can market Medicare services even um, to a patient and then being careful of inducement concerns. Um, we see groups setting up booths in a mall, giving things away, you know, do, doing things that are kind of out of the ordinary that we haven't seen. Um, you've probably seen this in other industries. DME has been the most common where you see the late night television commercial saying, you might be eligible for a scooter, call now, you know, Medicare will pay for it, it's free to you. Similar approach that these groups are taking saying, hey, you might be eligible for a cancer test. If you have a history of cancer in your family, call us now for this free uh, cancer test. And so that's their approach, how they acquire those patients. You know, it can be questionable. So you really want to dig into that and make sure you're comfortable with it before you partner up with them. Um, and then also there's some concerns around the ordering of that test, right? So oftentimes they are connecting the patient on the phone as they identify that they meet medical necessity with a telemedicine physician. And that telemedicine physician is then writing the lab order um, for this uh, cancer genetic test. So some of the dangers there are if the laboratory is paying this marketing group and the marketing group's paying the physician, there's concerns in my mind, at least, with uh, that being a, a kickback or an inducement where you have a money line going from the laboratory to the ordering physician. So I'd be careful there. And I would just say in general, um, before you start servicing someone's sample volume, to make sure you have a really good understanding of where it's coming from and how it's acquired. Um, and then you might want to get your, your legal team reviewing it. Um, other things that are coming into play right now is um, the different Medicare Max seem to be reimbursing differently and almost uh, significantly differently in some situations. Uh, we see Novitas in particular being a really attractive area for this cancer genetic testing. And so if you're a lab that's in Novitas, that's probably really good news. Uh, we do have a standing list of buyers looking to buy labs in Novitas for this region. They might be in a different region and need to acquire brick and mortar inside of Novitas in order to take advantage of um, the reimbursement rates affiliated with that. And so I would say that's a, that's a good thing. If you're, you're sitting there and you didn't know you were sitting on an asset, it might mean that you want to go ahead and add that testing in because you're going to be paid at a above average rate for that. Um, we also see interest in the first coast region of Florida for PGX. Um, and I can't really, you know, uh, go deep into the whys behind that, but I can tell you market trend wise, that that's, that's a real thing that's happening and everybody wants to be in these MACs in order to perform those types of testing. Reimbursement still, if the patient uh, meets me reimbursement, uh, or sorry, medical necessity requirements, that reimbursement is still available throughout the rest of them and is still better than average compared to most commoditized testing that you're seeing. Um, we also are seeing some loosening or at least uh, some signaling that there may be a loosening of the purse strings in Palmetto. Um, they put out a draft on molecular testing uh, a few weeks ago that seemed to indicate that they were going to reimburse for more, um, more molecular testing. Their LCD was going to be loosening up a little bit. So that's good news. Uh, I do think in general, there's been a lot of pressure for um, reimbursement of molecular tests. I think it is better science 
and it's been a matter of trying to collect enough data to put behind that so that the insurers and Medicare can uh, can get behind it and see the value that they're getting for what the, the test they're paying for, that they're going to see some savings as a result of that. I'm going to let, move on from that reimbursement part because I know Ann's going to get into it a little bit further. So I wanted to go in lab now and just talk a little bit about what would be involved in adding molecular testing to your lab. Um, when we're working with a lab to do this, we start off with the instrument selection. Um, we are vendor neutral where we do not represent any specific product line and um, we will bring quotes from all vendors. But I would say in general, there's you know two big players in this space right now that we see doing a majority of that work. And I think on the next slide, I talk about it a little bit more, but um, we, we would work with you to get quotes on the different instrumentation that's gonna be required, whether it was PCR based or a sequencing platform to perform these tests. Um, then the big thing that we contribute as Le at Lighthouse Lab Services is that LDT validation. So you're going to purchase an instrument that's not an FDA approved class two medical device. So it's not gonna be able to be used out of the box for clinical lab testing, um, but we can help you with that validation plan to go ahead and get that documented so that you can do clinical testing on those platforms. Um, we typically can get this done in about 90 days, right? So from the time that a lab comes to us, signs paperwork and says we're ready to go and order our instrument until the validation is complete and they're at go live for testing, takes about 90 days. That can go longer if you want to do a really broad menu, if you want to get away from the standard offering Canadian Consortium panel is, you know, more typical on the sequencing. Uh, if you want to do something custom, then it, it can add to that timeline. But uh, in general, we're seeing about 90 days. And that, that's typically with the outsourcing of that dry bench. And so the dry bench, you know, when I use those terms, we're saying wet bench is what we would call the in-lab where you're wearing a lab coat. And then the dry bench being more that bioinformatic um, data analysis, uh, variant scientists making calls and using software to analyze the, the lab results that are, are coming out. And so I would say your quickest route, and this is in particular on the sequencing test, the, your quickest route to market is to go ahead and validate that uh, wet bench in-house and outsource the dry bench. Uh, there's multiple different companies that will do that dry bench work for you now. And so you can just go ahead and send them a data file they have teams of scientists that can review that and result it out. We can provide those individuals as well. So we do have uh, remote variant scientists, genetic counselors that can um, do that, but you do need some software, right? So you're gonna need to probably partner with a group to start that has a database um, of these reports already generated because every different um, variant that you're seeing, you're gonna be creating a report and you don't wanna be doing that from scratch. So you would wanna at least partner with a group that's done a lot of that work so that you, you can get that um, reporting down from being a multi-hour uh, project in order to generate a report down to a few minutes if, those, um, if that library of reports and uh, variants is already established. So um, you do have the split of the wet bench and dry bench. And one thing that we're seeing that's kind of unique about that is that there's multiple different CLIAs being used in some of these workflows where we have um, one CLIA, uh, maybe two different cap accredited labs even I've seen that one of them is doing the wet bench and one is doing the dry bench, right? So um, you can be a CLIA and cap accredited and approved laboratory that might not do any wet lab testing. So it might be a cubicle farm that is a, a CLIA lab. And so that's kind of unique and it takes a little bit from uh, education or advocacy with your local inspector, perhaps, to make sure that they are uh, aware that that's a legitimate workflow that can happen and you don't need to have an eyewash station in the cubicle farm and trying to get them to see things in a different light. But we are seeing that to be a pretty well accepted um, workflow now and um, it gives some flexibility for groups as well. And it also offers flexibility for some unique billing. And so we work with a group of independent molecular pathologists that uh, do some dry bench work. Because they're doing that dry bench work, they're also doing diagnosis recommendation and do an overlay and maybe offer a peer-to-peer -peer consult from the ordering physician um, to this molecular pathologist that's looking at the lab data. They're able to bill that through their pathologist contracts. Um, so that opens up some in-network status billing um, for groups. And so if any of you guys are interested in that, I'd be happy to talk to you about it afterwards. But being able to split the two 
gives you the ability to build through the CLIA that is um, maybe has the most favorable position for, for reimbursement. Um, and so it could be based on what MAC that they're sitting in or what in-network status is that they hold. Um, these are the two different types of testing that we're covering here today, that qPCR-based testing. Typically, we're seeing that happen on the Thermo Fisher Quant Studio 12K Flex is the instrument that we see of choice or the kind of the one that most groups end up going with, the preferred method. And we we see that for the ID, so the infectious disease. So that's the, um, the wound, the GPP, the UTI, RPP, uh, fungal, women's health, STI. We see a lot of that happening on those those platforms or on that Thermo Fisher 12K platform. And then uh, next gen for CGX testing, you can do maybe infectious disease on these next gen sequencing platforms or even PGX, but not real common. Uh, we typically see groups going with a MySeq on the small side and maybe a NextSeq being the most common platform that's used for doing uh, CGX testing. Um, there is some really cool advancements. That NovaSeq that was announced by Illumina maybe a year or two ago um, is uh, really powerful. So if you have the volume to justify it, that can really drive down the cost of goods. Um, typically, we're seeing cost of goods for uh, CGX testing coming in at around if, you, if you're outsourcing it, so if you were going to work with another lab, maybe around $450 to $500 that we see a lab charging for CGX testing, cost of goods to do it in-house probably range from $350 to $400, $450 potentially, depending on how much volume you're doing. So this is definitely an area where running full batch and the more samples you have coming through, the more you can drive down the, the cost of good pricing. Um, but those are the... the platforms that we typically see. There are others out there, Autogenomics, uh, Ion Torrent. There's, there's a few other uh, platforms available, and there's some new stuff coming to market, which looks pretty neat as well. Uh, staffing for the molecular testing. This is probably a test that your existing med techs, if you've been running core lab testing or toxicology, are not going to be able to assist with. Um, so finding a molecular technologist, ASCP certified, MB molecular biologist um, would probably be the the gold standard to have for someone doing this testing. You need someone that can do DNA extraction amplification. Um, having someone that understands the dry bench side of things as well would be really helpful. You may also need to get a new laboratory director in place. And so, if your laboratory director, we commonly see toxicology labs adding molecular testing. And if you have a PhD toxicologist. Um, now that doesn't have any experience in this area, you might need to switch out your laboratory director to maybe an MD pathologist. So that's a pretty common ask that we have. And uh, we can help do that typically within two business days. And so if you need to swap your lab director, uh, like I said, we do offer or we do provide the medical lab directors to 150-ish CLIAs right now and uh, are able to help. We have a pretty deep bench in that area. Um, so you'd want to just look at that and make sure that your director qualifies to oversee molecular testing if you're going to add it in. And then dry bench staff, you know, we're happy to help recruit those people, but I wouldn't recommend it as a phase one approach to adding molecular testing. I think that's something that you probably want to do at phase two, right? Just too many moving parts. And it is kind of expensive to bring on these bioinformaticists as well as the variant scientists um, and all the software that's needed to bring that in-house. So once you get to a scale where it makes sense, I think you, you want to look at that, but come out of the gate, maybe just doing the, uh, the wet bench work. Um, different routes that we see from our customers that want to add in molecular testing, adding it into your current lab. We've talked about that a little bit. If you've already got a CLIA and you just need to add in this testing, we can do that through um, changing your test menu with CLIA, COLA, CAP, whoever you're accredited through, um, and then validating that LDT in-house. Uh, we do see groups looking to build a new lab. Um, we're seeing that you're probably four to six months um, on that if you're looking to go from scratch, depending on what region of the country you want to be in, we'd probably try to direct you towards the most favorable MAC for the type of testing that you're going to perform. Um, but from the time that we have a space, um, we're, we're going to help with, you know, that space selection, looking at different um, spaces that you might be considering, making sure that the HVAC, electrical and plumbing are appropriate. Once you do get into molecular testing, it is best to have multiple rooms, which is a little bit different from potentially other lab testing you might be doing, but we like to have three different rooms, ideally, um, for the DNA extraction, amplification. Um, we also 
want to have positive and negative airflow. So the HVAC there um, needs to be taken into consideration where you might not have had to do that in the past, but that's certainly something that we can help with if you're building a new lab, filing those CLIAs, getting the medical director and the molecular scientists all recruited. So that's something that you guys are interested in. Let us know if we can help. Uh, acquiring a, a pre-existing lab, we do have quite a few for sale right now. So if you're looking to get to market really quick, you want somebody that already has a Medicare up and running um, to be able to do this, we can we can help with that. One thing that we've done for a few groups now that's kind of unique and uh, it's an exemption that's buried in the CMS rules is that you can, if both CLIAs, so say you acquire another CLIA, so maybe you're not in Novitas, but you acquire a CLIA in Novitas, if your entity owns both labs, your lab now and this new one inside of uh, maybe a more favorable MAC, as long as they're both wholly owned by the same group, you do not fall under the 70-30 rules for uh, referring for just between those two labs, right? But that allows you to you know, acquire a group that's in a different MAC. You can re reference all the sample testing back to your original lab so you don't have to have um, you know, say sequencing validated in two different labs and be able to take advantage of uh, building it through the Mac that's more favorable. So um, I could follow up if somebody wanted more information on that, but there is some uh, creative strategic ways to approach the market um, by acquiring a, a lab that's already existing. Um, I did see a question came through from uh, Ebot about lab directors, definitely not limited to MD pathologists. We, um, for most of the lab directors we, have out there are PhDs, but once you get into overseeing multiple areas, that's where it becomes difficult to use a PhD. So if you're overseeing toxicology and molecular, it's, dif it's difficult to find a uh, lab director that's a PhD that has the years of experience required in both different subspecialties, where if you go to an MD pathologist, um, you're able to cover that a little bit easier. There are some PhD board certs that do um, cover across the board um, but say like the NRCC, which is specific to chemistry, and we typically see that in the toxicology area, uh, would not um, qualify under the molecular pathology area. So um, when I said upgrading to an MD, it's specifically for labs that would be doing multiple subspecialties. But that's a good question or a good comment. Thank you, Bob. All right. And then um, I guess wanting to learn more, we'll go ahead and I'll, I'll push this out now um, so that if you are interested in hearing any more about adding this to your lab, you go ahead and let us know. Um, we'll also give you a chance to respond um, after Ann gives a little bit more information on the reimbursement side of it, but I'll go ahead and uh, put that out there for those of you that are interested in going a little bit deeper. We'd be happy to set up a conversation to talk about the specifics of your lab and how we might be able to uh, assist with that. And so I don't know if anybody had any other questions on the scientific side, of um, the lab and on adding molecular testing into the labs, feel free to throw that out there now. Otherwise, I'm going to go ahead and uh, hand things over to uh, Anne so she can jump into the reimbursement side, which is probably what most of you would would like to hear about anyway. So I'll give a minute to just see if there's any question. Um, looks like Nassaro wants some more information. Um, affiliation between different laboratories and parallel studying. I might have to go offline with you, Nassaro, to get a little bit more information on exactly what you're looking for there, but I'd be happy to speak with you and see if we can assist in any way. Um, but I will go ahead at this time and hand it over to Ann Lambert. She's the Vice President of Client Services for Vachette Pathology. Vachette, like I said, is well-respected in the industry. They've been around a long time, and um, they actually come at it from the expertise of uh, auditing other billing groups, right? So they're they're auditing the billing groups to see that they're doing their job right. So they, they have a really wide view of the industry and uh, have seen how it's done by many different uh, re revenue cycle management and billing companies and are able to uh, take all of that collective knowledge that they see and bring it to us today and bring it to the, their customers to make sure that they're getting paid um, the best that they can and collecting uh, every dollar that they should. So I'll go ahead and I'll hand it over to Ann, and then we'll take some more questions at the end. Great. Thanks. Thank you for that introduction. Um, so I'm Ann Lambrix. Uh, we're going to go over the some best practices uh, to um, implement if you are considering um, incorporating this testing or trying to identify what's next. If you've already brought this into your lab, 
Um, I will address questions at the end. There may be, um, please keep your questions coming. There may be a lot that pop in and, and I don't want you to think I'm ignoring them. Um, it'll just help me to keep the flow uh, if I address them at the end. Um, again, today we, we wanted to discuss the best practices um, and um, determine, again, if you've already brought this testing into your laboratory or considering um, what steps do you need to take um, to uh, position yourself for billing and, and, and collecting um, on these tests. Um, what, what we've determined, it's, it's important to review what type of testing you're planning on incorporating into your lab and ensure that you explore all the necessary tools and resources needed in order to not only perform the test, but to bill correctly and get paid on the test performed. So CPT coding uh, is very specific on the type of testing, the methodology, the platform, um, and whether or not the individual test performed falls within a panel. So if it's performed with other tests, uh, whether or not it needs to be pulled into that panel or billed separately. Uh, it's imperative to review um, these tests, your test menu and the correct coding for the test panels you're providing to your clients or patients. Um, for example, in January of 2019, we saw some changes in the coding. Um, AMA added that CPT code 81443, which is a, it's a genetic testing for severe inherited conditions. So there's multiple tests. I think it's 15 or more tests that would fall under that panel. And if you're performing all those tests for those particular patients, um, you need to bill it under a panel. And again, it's going to be required on your payer guidelines as well, whether or not you roll it into a panel or if you unbundle each individual test. So you'll, you'll need to understand that. Um, the patient's diagnosis is also important when it comes to the reimbursement for these tests. CGX testing, uh, the payer's looking for whether the patient is predisposed genetically for a condition, whereas molecular testing is directing treatment for an active, active or suspicion of a disease. Uh, the patient's diagnosis will typically trigger the LCDs or NCDs or frequency limitations that you must be aware of. Um, we talk about understanding your payer mix, which I believe uh, assists in building a good process to check those necessary boxes, um, again, regarding CPT coding and diagnosis coding requirements, the medical necessity requirements for those tests. Um, Although uh, these tests may be reimbursable by the payer, it is imperative that you step back and know what upfront requirements are needed for billing and payment by the payers you're billing to. Despite the continued enhancement of science and technology, as well as the patients and physicians' increased demand for molecular and genetic testing, there are very specific pre-authorization and notification requirements that must be completed prior to billing. As mentioned in my first slide, understanding those local coverage determination and payer guidelines on the testing level of testing and the frequency of testing is important as it will help you develop the necessary front end steps to ensure payment. Um, again, you know, what we're looking for is, is what you can set up on the front end versus on the back end um, and, and making sure that that process is very uh, efficient and smooth. Um, it can be a relatively time consuming process. Um, so it'll be important for you to review on an operational level what will be required by your lab or biller to ensure prior auth and notification expectations and coverage, coverage requirements by the various payers are being met and maintained. So things like what interfaces are needed, what type of communication upfront processes are in place with the ordering physician, does the requisition clinical and if not, what steps are needed to improve? Someone, someone on your team is going to need to manage this, and I would recommend someone that likes digging and is a good communicator, um, someone that has that experience uh, in, in reviewing these types of, of well, and again, we're going to talk about back-end denials um, here shortly, but looking at those denials, looking up those front-end pre-authorization requirements, and again, implementing processes on the front-end to prevent those denials. All right, next slide. So we talked about denials, or I just mentioned denials. Um, to me, this is a key to enhancing your front end processes to get paid. Um, you'll need a good biller or good billing software to be able to run denial reporting and trend denials by payer and by the CPT code. Um, 
Someone on your team will need to be able to evaluate these denial trends and determine what is needed to reduce, eliminate those denials. Um, again, important to look at your staffing, your billing operation, and determine if you have the right people on the job. We see a lot of billers that want to bill for this type of testing. Um, and everyone, when you go into sales, they're going to have lots of experience and knowledge. Um, again, I would recommend um, having them provide examples of, if you're in this type of testing, what other labs they're billing for that perform molecular and genetic testing specifically. Um, the medical science and technology is growing by leaps and bounds, but I would argue that the reimbursement and coverage is slowly following suit. So you're going to need someone that can troubleshoot denials and errors and efficiently fix problems within the revenue cycle so that payment comes in with minimal intervention. So I wanted to put this um, pricing example for common tests um, out there because again, um, a lot of times we get, we get calls um, saying, you know, what does Medicare pay for such and such a test? So what I wanted to do is make the point that just because there's a fee doesn't mean you'll get paid. Um, as I mentioned previously, medical necessity and frequency limitations are some of the potential denials you may see for your test. And if you're outside of these requirements, you will not get paid. So just because there's a payment on a fee schedule doesn't mean that reimbursement's going to follow suit. So um, location matters. We talked about understanding your payer mix. Um, obviously, your location is going to impact the prior authorization um, and local coverage, coverage determinations um, that will impact billing and collections. Um, some of the top laboratory management programs that you're most likely familiar with, um, the MOLDEX program, uh, it's the molecular diagnostic program um, administered through Palmetto and McKesson, or Change Healthcare. Um, United Healthcare has a laboratory uh, management program, Anthem, or Blue Cross Blue Shield, but however, I see um, Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, utilize EVCOR, um, and EVCOR uh, does the laboratory management for many payers, uh, again, depending on the state you're in. And there are others, um, and we'll go into that in, a, in the additional slides. However, going back to that payer mix, it's very important to understand what payers you're going to be billing this to. Um, again, uh, looking at those patient demographics and then determining, based on the payer mix, what requirements are going to need to be put in place in order to um, ensure payment. Uh, the MOLDEX program, I think, is a, a pretty big program. Um, their coverage is in the following max, Meridian, Palmetto, CGS. Um, tests are registered on the Diagnostic Exchange. Uh, the test is approved. Medicare or, or Moldex assigns the CPT. Um, so I think that's very important to note. Um, that unique test identifier, which is a Z code, is assigned or it's provided, and it must link to that test um, and CPT that's been approved. So it's been linked. That Z code uh, defines that particular CPT code and the test that's being billed for it. And we see a lot of groups where that's not fully understood. Um, and again, making sure that you have somebody that can work with um, the diagnostics exchange and uh, communicate back and forth if there's denials, um, figuring out if it's something on the MOLDEX or the diagnostics, diagnostic exchange program, if there's an error there in their system. Because guess what? Uh, they make errors too. Um, these are the affected codes um, for the MOLDEX program, and I would argue that most of your laboratory management programs, their, their pre-authorization requirements, similar or mirror these similarly uh, to uh, the MOLDEX program. Um, some of the molecular testing, such as the women's health or infectious disease, would not full, fall under that. Um, however, those uh, types of testing would most likely, you know, you're going to have to know your medical necessity or frequency limitation requirements. Uh, United Healthcare, um, that's been in place since November 1st, 2017, I believe, except in Florida, um, where the Beacon LBS program uh, has been implemented. Um, UHC utilizes Beacon LBS for their, I would say, the ordering software, um, and there's a whole process of getting your tests 
um, prior authorized or, again, in their system so that the ordering physician can order or prior authorize the test before uh, it comes over to the lab for, for, for a review. EVCOR, another one, uh, again, depending on the state you're in. Um, going back to United Healthcare, that should be in, in pretty much every state except for Florida, where they have another program, um, depending on the place of service. EVCOR um, is an intermediary, intermediary working with various payers to supply medical necessity pre-authorization review. Um, they're similar to other lab management programs. Uh, they, they utilize the online portal. Um, you'll need to register uh, for that portal, and, and again, the authorization is done, done in that portal. Um, the requirements are payer-specific, and, and as I've mentioned in the webinar, um, you'll need someone to manage this information. And that's something that I, I really want to drive home on this presentation, is that you really need someone on staff uh, to be able to manage this information and, and develop front-end processes to uh, make sure your tests are approved and they're going to get paid. And these are some of the other um, authorization um, programs. AIM, Specialty Health is another, I would say, similar to the EV Core Beacon and Avalon. All right, so we're seeing a significant change in the landscape of molecular and genetic pathology. Um, you know, again, everyone is very excited to start billing this out or start performing and billing out this testing, um, which is exciting. However, it can be frustrating. There's significant um, local coverage determinations, which are very specific on the medical necessity um, of the test. Um, and there's also, as we've discussed, some stringent pre authorization programs that you need to make sure are implemented um, for these tests prior to billing. Um, and again, as I've mentioned, um, making sure you have the appropriate staff or biller that's able to um, determine, um, based on billing and denial trends, what needs to be corrected in order to get reimbursed. That is all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ann. That was great. Um, appreciate you uh, taking the time to share some of your wisdom and expertise with all of us. Um, if you guys have any questions right now, feel free to go ahead and put those into the Q&A area, and then we will uh, we'll try to answer some of those. While you're doing that, I will um, just give the results of that poll that we ran earlier. And so um, we had asked, do you guys currently perform any molecular testing in your lab? And um, I'm surprised at how many, 58%, 44 of the labs came back saying that they do, uh, 12 labs saying, no, we don't, that's about 16%, and uh, 20 labs, or a little over 25%, 26% of you guys um, do not do molecular testing yet, but are looking to get into it. So um, certainly uh, a lot of interest in that area, and um, you know, we'd be happy to help any of those interested parties with, uh, with making that happen. I would also recommend, I'm going to go ahead and put a, a, a pop-up on your screen now. So if you want to hear more about anything that uh, Ann mentioned and you'd like to speak with Vachette, you can either call them, her number's on the screen and the email address as well, or you can click the Next Steps button there on that Launch Molecular and we will connect you uh, with either Scientific Consulting or uh, with Vachette for any reimbursement, billing, revenue cycle management consulting advice. Um, there will be a recording, a copy of this recording. I see Jack um, asking that question. Uh, Jack, we can certainly get you a copy of that, and that'll be available to all of you that are on the presentation. Look, there's about 108 of you that attended, um, and I think about 300 registered. But we will um, send out a link to that recording so you can listen to that or follow up or share it with uh, your team afterwards. There's no cost for that. As we've said before, we, we do this for free. There's no cost for attending any of our webinars. Um, but we do hope that you'll keep us in mind if you do ever need our services. So if you need uh, assistance with uh, acquiring a lab, growing your lab, or validating an LDT or any other type of consulting, please let us know. And if you need assistance uh, getting your billing company audited or you're looking for guidance on best practice for your revenue cycle management team, please reach out to Ann at Bichette 
And uh, I know that it would be money well spent and you're going to net a positive there uh, once you introduce them and you start maximizing uh, your collections and reimbursement rates. So um, we have a couple questions uh, coming in. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to address those. Uh, best Mac for genetic testing, kind of a, a broad question because it is specific to type, I, I think. And I don't know if, Ann, if you have anything additional to add, but I would say typically we see um, groups that are looking to do um, cancer genetic testing, CGX, want to um, set up shop in a Novitas Mac. And yes. I've seen groups wanting to do PGX testing favoring First Coast in Florida. Um, anything else to add to that, Ann? No, I would agree. And, and again, looking at that Moldex, you know, the Novitas doesn't have that Moldex requirement. Um, and so there's, there's, as far as on the um, pre-authorization requirements, you're looking at um, the managed care programs that have those authorization, but Medicare does not. So you just need to, to look at the LCDs, which, again, they're not as extensive uh, as we see in other MACs. Perfect. And again, when um, I say they're, they're not as prohibitive for billing right. and, and payment. Yeah, just, yeah, a little bit uh, broader uh, application of their LCDs, I believe, right? And just a little bit more room to uh, to get claims through, um, but doesn't guarantee that everything's going to get paid. Um, Fred had asked what our fees are for lab setup. Um, for infectious disease, we charge $1,900 a month, and that's for 12 months. Um, to get you validated for an infectious disease panel, whether that's UTI or PP or whatever one you choose. If you want to do more than that, it gets a little bit cheaper for any additional ones. And for PGX and CGX, we charge $2,900 a month um, per. So if you want to do CGX, it'd be $2,900 a month or CGX, $2,900 a month. And uh, that's a 12-month term as well. And that covers us um, project managing that, helping you select the instrumentation, helping you um, validate that LDT will send our PhDs down to your lab to get that validated in-house and uh, get recruiting the scientists you need in order to perform that testing. We do have a, per, a set fee, if you like, and we can go into that as well um, and some other options. But hopefully that answers your question, Fred. If you want to hear more, um, please reach out to us or click that Launch Molecular button and we will follow up with you directly to generate a custom proposal for you. Um, Mano has a question is, how is reimbursement with commercial payers as most of them require prior authorization? Um, and are you seeing that most groups that are doing molecular testing favoring federal samples, uh, Medicare, Medicaid? Uh, what are you seeing on the commercial side? Who's paying, who's not, and any guidance uh, for that? Well, again, I would say that most payers are paying. It depends on you know what type of testing that you're performing. They're paying. Um, however, you have to get the, the test authorized. So they're paying if it's medically necessary. Um, and so it's look, looking at those payer guidelines. And, and Mano, if you want to provide me your contact information, you know, we can take this offline and, and look at what particular testing, and I might be able to address specifically um, some of the tests that you're performing and what we're seeing with commercial I will payers. say I – thank you. Uh, that's perfect. Um, I would say I ran into a group, and I can't speak to them as a verified reference here yet because I haven't I haven't seen it come out the other side, but uh, that has created a software that does the um, prior authorization at the point of sale. And so they're saying that would happen in the clinic while the patient is standing there. Um, they have some software to collect some information from the um, patient and then uh, determine if that person's meeting those medical necessity requirements, which sounds um, pretty good. Um, we'll, we'll see if they deliver on that, but they have been spending the last year developing that software to be able to to do that. And I know other other um, billing software oftentimes has that built in as maybe an added feature. Um, this is the first time I've seen it at, at point of sale where the pa patient is right there while it's occurring. Um, and so we have another question from uh, Nizrin. Uh, that's saying, what is the feedback on utilizing CPT 81455? Currently, our MAC does not provide any LCD guidelines for reimbursement, although it does have a fee. Um, that would be a question that hopefully you might be able to answer in, but that's not a, not probably one that I can tackle. Yeah, again, um, that's, I believe, a panel code. Um, therefore, you'd have to look at the individual tests, um, the, gen the genes that are being tested for, um, and, and whether it falls within that, that particular CPT. Um, and if there are no specific LCDs for Medicare, 
um, then I would recommend looking at your commercial carriers. If you're only billing Medicare, then it's just making sure that that, uh, that particular MAC that you're within um, doesn't have that Moldex requirement where you need that Z identifier. If you do, you need to get that pre-approved. Um, so again, if, if you want to provide me your feedback, we can look at that uh, more specifically for you. Excellent. Uh, Anna C has a question about billing software. And so she's saying, what's the best software? She specifically to Florida. I don't know if, um, if the software will, recommendation would differ per state, um, but for molecular genetic testing and billing. I know, you know, a few different pieces of software that we recommend for the laboratory side of molecular testing and, um, Ovation does a great job with that. There's several others as well. On the billing side, um, you know, some of the big ones, Zyphin, Tricor, um, I think are, are available. What do you, what do you think though, Anne? have you seen anybody that's doing, um, that better than others? Is there a go-to recommendation for lab billing software, especially as it relates to molecular genetic testing? Um, I would agree the Zyphin and Telcores of the world, those I would say are the, um, ones that have been in this. Uh, particular industry for some time and have developed some upfront um, uh, upfront requirements in order to ensure that these tests are, are um, what's needed to build these tests are, is has been completed. They also use denial trending to enhance that front end. Um, so I, I would recommend those as well. Um, they tend to be more expensive, so I know that's typically a, a hurdle, but um, it's either you know invest in a good software or potentially not collect on these particular tests. Yeah, I think other things that come into play are uh, sometimes your LIS system might have a billing component so that you might want to ask about that or weigh that, whether that uh, is available. Maybe maybe they do it as do a decent job. Some of them don't do a great job. And typically we see that um, software companies, in my experience, they either do the in-lab LIS system well and maybe not the billing as well, or vice versa when groups have tried to do both. But um, I think there's a place for having it all under one umbrella, and especially if you're a, a startup, you're on the smaller side, um, Dyson might be too expensive until you get to a scale where it makes sense. Um, we have Fred is uh, weighing in with Ovation Rocks, so like the Ovation, and uh, so that's good to hear. Um, I don't, we've had a good experience with them as well. Um, Mano had another question about coding, wants to know if the coding differs for next-gen sequencing versus PCR methods. I'll speak to, I think there are um, times when you could perform a test, um, you know, like infectious disease or PCR, you know, you could do that on a next-gen sequencing platform versus a cube PCR platform. Typically from a scientific standpoint, I know Dr. Fuller, who's on the line, might be able to weigh in if we need to go deeper on this. Um, it can be done, but you, you don't see many labs do it because it's typically more expensive, right? So unless you're doing really something specific, you're trying to uh, create a, a unique panel or go deeper or something, there's a reason for you to do it on a sequencing platform. Typically, you would do those on um, the PCR platform just because it's going to be a little bit cheaper. But, uh, Anne, I don't know if you have any comments related to how that affects billing. So if you were to do um, an infectious disease test or you're going to do a pharmacogenomics test and you did it on um, a next generation sequencing analyzer versus a uh, qPCR based instrument does that affect um, the code that you would use that you know of again it's going to depend on the test um, the test that you're performing there could be multiple cpts uh, depending on the the type or the platform that you're using utilizing okay and I, I, probably, I know that's very vague, um, but that's where we get in trouble with um, this type of testing. Comparing it to like an anatomic um, pathology or even clinical, um, the coding for these tests, it's, it's much more complex. And, and I think labs hop into this thinking it's a simple, we're going to plop the CPT code on this test, and, and it's not. Um, and so it's got to be very specific uh, depending on the test you're performing. Yeah, so so many of these questions um, and a lot of questions I get today are, are loaded. It's really hard to generalize because there's a lot of factors um, in answering some of those questions. And I have a couple of more of them that may be along those lines, Anne. And so if you, if you feel that it's better to take them offline, just let me know. But Shay wanted to know, 
how many times you can bill the 87798 um, for infectious disease. He feels like it varies lab to lab within different MACs. Um, not sure yeah, I, I would say it's, re it's, it's reviewing your LCD and it's also reviewing your MUE requirements. So medically unlikely edit will limit um, based on the test. It will say we consider this particular test medically reasonable to um, bill once per patient per day or per year. So it will be listed in their MUA, MUE requirements or um, in your LCD at the very bottom. Typically, it'll talk about frequency limitations. Excellent. Um, and I think that that's all we have. We're up against the clock here. So we've taken the, the full hour that we asked of you guys, and I appreciate you attending. Um, as always, it's good to just get everybody together, exchange information. We are trying to create a healthy lab ecosystem here, and I think knowledge is um, a key part of that and being able to share knowledge from one group to another. Oftentimes, labs view themselves as uh, competitors with other labs, but I think more often than not, um, having us join together in a united voice for advocacy for reimbursement against PAMA, commercial payer issues, some of those things are going to be more powerful than viewing each other as competition. Very rarely, I think, are we um, competing with uh, another lab here in, uh, that might be on the webinar or wherever they may be. That We're typically not fighting over the same, the same patients and same customers, right? Uh, so I think, in general, the lab has done a really poor job of advocating for themselves. Um, I bring this up frequently, but over 70% of medical decisions are made based on laboratory data and about 2.6% of healthcare spend goes to the lab. That means that there's a lot of value that's being created by the laboratory and they're not seeing a, a lot of the, the fruits of that. And so I think we need to do a better job of advocating as an industry. Um, I would throw in a recommendation if you're not already a, a NILA member and you are an independent lab, the National Independent Lab Association um, advocates, they have lobbyists on the Hill that will uh, advocate for independent lab rights and trying to um, fight things like PAMA cuts and uh, EKRA legislation. Um, and uh, they engage the commercial payers to try to get uh, independent labs in network. And so I think all of healthcare is stronger, the more different types of labs and different types of uh, testing that's available and more groups that are working on innovative things. So I thank all of you guys for attending today. Hopefully you found value in it. Extra thanks to Anne for giving her expertise. Please follow up and let us know if you're interested in speaking with her or reach out to her directly. I think that um, you'll see a big benefit to uh, the value that Bichette brings. So thank you all and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you.